Welcome back to the channel. I hope you all are having a great evening, great day. Um, so, uh, Zen on the Binance chain, uh, what we call Big Zen, BXEN, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's up well over 400% over the last 30 days, right? So, these uh, gains that are happening in the Zen ecosystem, as we can see, this means that it's not just happening on Ethereum. That's a good thing, right? So we're going to talk about that today, but it's not going to be all peaches and cream. It's not going to be all good. We're going to actually uh, talk about some concerns I have for the Zen project. Um, and of course, on the entertainment, uh, education, entertainment, television show, uh, we're not a punk channel. We're not a um, a rah 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 channel for a cryptocurrency. Here, we focus on what cryptocurrencies make the most sense, why they make the most sense. We look under the hood, um, and uh, uh, we make decisions based on that. So we want to have all information available, and we want to take a look at these projects. Uh, so that uh, we don't run into many pitfalls some of them seem to have uh, through their uh, uh, through their uh, the routes many of the, the projects take uh, so the good the good news about uh, this happening on uh, Binance you know uh, one huge concern was that uh, um, Ethereum was starting to kind of lock out uh, participants, right? You want to have a participatory uh, economy in these projects. And uh, uh, Ethereum, with the ridiculous fees, right, um, it, it causes us to lack that participation for many of us. Uh, and that's not a good thing. And that's not the idea of why uh, we want projects like this to create it the way they are. And uh, right, these are the very same reasons that it drove uh, projects like the, the Post projects, the Richard Hart ecosystem projects to run away from Ethereum. Uh, it is why everybody's uh, major goal is to run away from Ethereum, right? So for us to celebrate Ethereum breakthroughs is not a, uh, a good thing. Uh, situation we want to be in. That's not what we want to do. Um, so, uh, the good news again is the fact that uh, these other blockchains, whether it be Zen, uh, or I'm sorry, rather, whether it be uh, Binance or uh, Polygon, uh, whether it be Avalanche or, uh, you know, many of the other uh uh, chains that as in exists on you don't hear much about the other ones because the volume is so thin uh, that you don't really uh, you know there's not really you know much opportunity there but Zen might or, or Binance Zen might be now uh, opening up the way for uh, us to see some activity uh, with a much lower fee significant lower fees um, and that might uh, cause a lot more value coming into uh, the Zen ecosystem. And uh, so I'm okay with what if we want to go with the idea of, uh, uh, a, a, you know, a, a rising tide lifts all ships or, or, or what have you. That's not so much a problem. But we don't want this to become uh, a situation where we're just dealing with another cryptocurrency uh, with not a lot of participation, not a lot of representation, not a lot of decentralization. Uh, and this has been the course of many cryptocurrencies and this is what we don't want. So uh, whereas great news with Binance, um, you know, a lot of people are probably moving to Binance because of the, not only the ridiculous fees with Ethereum, but uh, some people felt they've missed their move with Zen, going up so high, going up a thousand percent uh that discourages some people from getting in uh thinking that they're kind they've kind of missed the boat uh whereas we know many of these crypto projects can go a lot a great deal higher 
But anyway, now let me talk about my issues concerning Zen. Uh, I want to talk about that. And uh, uh, so we don't have a one-sided channel. Uh, uh, a good uh, portion of the cryptocurrency channels are typically people who hold considerable amount of cryptocurrency in certain underlying projects and then they are then incentivized and motivated to push these projects, right? Uh, whether they're good or bad, if they're holding a lot of assets in those cryptocurrencies, they're going to push them. And uh, I made a pact uh, with myself that we wouldn't do that on the, inter the education entertainment television channel. So um, if you're wondering why you're here, those are the reasons you're here because you're that small group of people who uh, don't want to just hype up prices and hype up these concepts and ideas, but really uh, get behind projects that work. And I know that's not for everybody. I know some people just want to make money. Uh, okay, that's uh, have added and good luck to you, sir. Uh, but we are more uh, a practical approach like you do any responsible investment. And uh, so we, we're have, we have a different uh direction with how we do things right uh let's get into my concerns about zen and i might even contrast some areas where i think the problems have been solved by other projects like bitcoin myk that i'm part of and what you have to understand is when you get to sit back and look at the mistakes that many projects have made over the years it becomes a lot easier to come in and create plans to correct those mistakes right and so we're going to talk about that um, and uh, get into that a little bit. My concerns about uh, the Zen cryptocurrency project. Okay, I've taken the liberty here of making a few notes here. So let's talk about the first issue uh, I, I'm having with Zen or I see with Zen, and that is no layer one. Now we know that in 20. 24 is the approximated date um, that Zen may launch a layer one, right? Now, uh, all things considered, that sounds good. That makes Zen bullish and, 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 and those things are good. But as we know in cryptocurrency, the future is seldom has been promised to us. And whereas uh, I do think Jack Levin has a much greater chance of executing a layer one project more so than the post uh, ecosystem under Richard Hart, uh, which nobody really knows what's going on. Uh, I think that uh, when we look into the decision of who's making the time frames when these layer ones are uh, launched and so on, there is a certain amount of that going into the court of Jack Levin, it would seem. And that is a problem because uh, it could be that it doesn't launch, right? And what happens is it, if it doesn't launch, well, we're more so like another uh, hex ecosystem, post-chain ecosystem. And then some might say, oh, but it's Jack Levin. It's certainly going to launch. Okay, granted, uh, many of us have a great a deal more uh, faith in Jack Levin than many other in the cryptocurrency community, but the the the, the problems uh, still remains that even if Jack Levin were to release it in uh, 2024 first quarter, and even if he was on time, that still doesn't mean that this period uh, in the interim couldn't be, uh, or Zen couldn't be uh, uh, overtaken by another similar project that would launch earlier similar to in other words we could have a a situation like what we got with the hex ecosystem the post ecosystem uh where it takes too long to launch and somebody else does it faster right so you know maybe that doesn't happen but that is a possibility next the the next big issue with zen is the Ethereum is the bulk of transactions. So if we're being honest, the the entire value of Zen is basically uh, composed of Ethereum gas fees that create a 
uh, a, a bottom, right, to the Zen price. It kind of creates this threshold where Zen can't, doesn't really, will never really fall below that. That's interesting. That in itself is not a huge problem, but where it becomes a, a, an issue, uh, because I actually think that's a great idea. I think that's genius to, you know, to preserve the value of the, the project and the price of minting. But the issue is, um, um, as long as it stays on Ethereum, and if Ethereum really is the only successful chain for Zen right now, uh, which it seems is going to be for a while, uh, then what that means is that there is a special elite group class in Ethereum that seized already a great portion of Zen on Ethereum. And it's probably not going to be likely those people are going to be overcome unless they sell a lot of their stakes. Uh, also, it's kind of elitist in that uh, uh, these people can afford very high Ethereum fees. That's going to eliminate a lot of that participatory economy. It is a huge problem. And what it does is it kind of becomes a situation where the dog's chasing his tail and we're not out of the situation we're trying to get out of. Thus, we are not out of adhering to first layer principles of decentralization across the spectrum, right? Uh, the next problem uh, that I think is a big issue is the hyperinflated supply, as I call it. And that is uh, much like the Richard Hart model. You know, you're going to trillions of trillions of coins so that people can mend and stake. And, that, and whereas that is interesting, uh, typically what's happened with many of these projects is that there aren't a lot of stake, stakers, right? They're percentage wise, you know, uh, there aren't really a lot of that going on. And that's a, and, and what that tells the market is that a lot of people don't want to be holding these cryptocurrencies with heavy supplies, right? Because uh, right, they don't want to get caught holding the bag, right? And this is where Bitcoin succeeds because whereas many of the Bitcoin maximalists, Bitcoin developers will tell you, oh, they can pretty much build anything on Bitcoin. Why do we need these other cryptocurrencies? You can do all this stuff on Bitcoin. Whereas they'll tell you that uh, uh, what is what is true with Bitcoin is that they believe, uh, and I'm sure it's, it's uh, technically possible to do all these things on Bitcoin. Uh, the problem is they're doing it with a 21 million supply, a supply right? that amount of scarcity is going to create such a great deal of value in Bitcoin. And, and because people are going that route, why is it that many of these projects insist on having trillions of coins? Just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, uh, if everybody's saying they can do everything on Bitcoin that people are doing with these altcoins, uh, uh, why not just follow a more Bitcoin model, a more deflationary model? uh where you know where your your value is naturally protected you don't have to protect it in gas ridiculous gas fees that's eliminated many participants out of that economy uh the next thing uh problem is the uh, what i call the hex inherited community so it's no question that a, a great amount of the participants came uh who are participating in Zen now have come out of hex or will come out of come from hex and in, in the post chain ecosystem because the products are so similar right uh, the problem with that though is that uh i call it in a way a contamination problem and let me explain what i mean about that not so much that i don't think it was a problem that jack levin went over there and some people might richard hart might look at it like he stole the hex community i don't think that's so much a problem uh, you know, this is the idea of these markets, having people have an option to uh, go with the better products and so and so on. And that creates uh, better products for us all. Right. So that is not the problem. The problem is. I would look at the hex community, unfortunately, and I wasn't one of them, but I would look at them as fanatical for the most part or were. 
And the problem with that is a lot of that fanaticism came out of the camp of Richard Hart's uh, get, get rich quick ideas, right? And I know people would say, uh, oh, well, Richard Hart talked about um, uh, denying short-term gratification, right? And, and, and certainly he did with the staking and so on to a degree. But even if he meant that his reverse psychology was all created within Hex as these kind of, even, even the beginning websites look like these get rich quick sites, right? So the mentality of the Hex community is always price appreciation, which is different from what you get in successful communities like the Bitcoin community, where it's not necessarily price appreciation, it's price stability and price, uh, 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 or, or rather, I'm sorry, high volume, right? Uh, high liquidity, the fact that you can really use this as a money now and it could absorb so much of that, right? So that's that's the, the problem with Hex is Hex is kind of still like the Lambo Dreams community, right? There, like we gave the example in the last video of the Miami baller scene where now people are walking into the Miami hotspots. Uh, I'm a Florida native. I was born in and raised in Florida I spent a lot of time in Miami, and so what's happening in the Miami scene is everybody's walking into walking into these uh, uh, these uh, hot spots in Miami, and they're saying, "Hey, what happened to the, the the crypto millionaires and billionaires? This guy was buying all the bottles, popping all the bottles uh, every weekend, and whatever happened to that guy? And they've they've all vanished. That's the running joke that's going on now, right?" that these guys uh, no longer have that buying power behind them. But the reason they don't have that buying power too has a lot to do, I believe, with the mentality of what the Hex community, uh, not not that it's so much their fault, uh, I, but part of Richard Hart's marketing and tactics just was a natural evolution into that. Uh, lastly, and that's a problem, obviously, because then you're going to have, you know, people uh, looking at probably Zen not long term, going to have a lot of great pumps and probably dumps in Zen for a good while longer and so on. Um, the last part I will talk about is the Jack Levin's economic philosophy, namely saying, number one, we're not quite sure what it is. He doesn't seem to be, uh, uh, I don't think, all the way in the camp of Satoshi. And uh, that uh, I think Satoshi, uh, let me just put it this way. I kind of see, and I could be wrong about this, Jack Levin could actually be both of these things. Or maybe it's just, uh, uh, just you know, in certain instances, in certain lights, it seems this way. But Jack Levin, um, whereas in Satoshi's idea, I looked at Bitcoin more as not about getting rich with Bitcoin, but setting people free, setting our money free, giving your money back to you under control by your not control of governments or entities or organizations. Uh, whereas I, I looked at Richard Hart's view is getting rich and getting rich. And I kind of see now Jack Levin is an amalgam of the two, right? Which could be good. I'm not saying that that won't be successful uh, in the short term, but in the long term, it could be a problem. Uh, as I've seen some people making jokes around Twitter about Jack Levin, that as Zen gets more successful, he starts to exhibit traits similar to Richard Hart. Remember, Richard Hart didn't start as the Louis Vuitton million dollar bag toting. He started as the Robin Hood of crypto, right? The well penalties, the big well penalties and take from the rich and give to the poor, right? And so on and so forth. Uh, so there's this kind of debate between the idea of blockchain technology, Bitcoin being capitalist or being something else. And Craig Wright, who supposedly was the real Satoshi, argued this point as well. And whereas he talked about um, Bitcoin being this capitalist model, we'll just make money. It was never meant for people to mine it at home on their computers, but to have these large data centers, the average person couldn't control, right? Uh, and so 
what has happened to Craig right now? Well, his version of Bitcoin isn't as successful as the, the, the Bitcoin core as we know it. And it's not even as successful as Bitcoin Cash and is no longer as successful as many other projects, right? Due to his philosophy. So my entire point is, is Jack Levin's economic philosophy could be an issue for Zen? Possibly. I think it could be because I'm not totally on board with Jack's view of some economic principles. That's just my thoughts on it, but I think they could come back and be a problem in the end. I think I'll just conclude with Bitcoin MYK, how mining works um, in our in our platform, right? So first, let me pose this question. Let's say we're talking to the general populace. We're talking to people out there trying to get them involved in cryptocurrency, waiting for all these people to come in, and they're given a choice. The choice goes something like this. They can download something out off GitHub to mine uh, a cryptocurrency, right? They can, uh, uh, so that means they're going to have to have some technical knowledge. Or they could do normal things they do through social media interfaces every day and mine and generate the cryptocurrency that way, right? For becoming a member, right? They earned 10 Bitcoin MYK tokens. For visiting uh, a site, right? Visiting somebody's profile page, they earn a token, right? Uh, for making friends, they earn tokens. And you see what's happening there? If you give people that kind of choice, that the things they do every day um, in our world, in our how it's becoming engulfed in this technology, chat GPT, that's gonna take all the jobs from most people. Can you see that this type of future involvement in a type of participatory economy like this would be more appealing to those people? In other words, right? And, and this is why I keep pushing ideas like Bitcoin, MYK, as the future and that's also that's why i'm not worried because i've been right about hex i've been right about zen so my track record is good uh am i going to be right about bitcoin and yk probably so more than likely yes uh why because common sense approach logic and reason but if you give those people that choice they're not going to say they want to understand how wallets work how interface and wallets with Ethereum like apps works. They're not going to say any of those things, right? I know a lot of people talk about custody, admin keys. Listen, that matters, right? But only up to a certain extent. If we look at something like the post community, right? Nobody has admin keys, but that doesn't stop somebody from controlling 90% of that supply. The thing about Bitcoin and YK is its entire model is predicated on distribution, right? Well, there is, it's eliminate all the elitist class, all the development classes, is eliminated all those things where everybody can compete and participate. And that's why I know if given the opportunity, how this algorithm works, right? It finds you, it can extrapolate the value of the activity you're doing and anybody can do it. I know that a model like this that we've developed that's working and people are using is undefeated against any other type of applications. And because it's all free and they're getting the cryptocurrency free, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of a type of control system where people dump on you and do this and that becomes a lot more difficult because it becomes a lot easier for distribution to happen between holders, participants in their wallets, right? So if you like information like this, make sure you subscribe to the channel, watch all our Bitcoin MYK videos. Uh, I think Zen's a great project, but not without its problems. Uh, uh, and that's what we do here on the channel. We look in a very objective way. It doesn't matter if it's our own cryptocurrency. It doesn't matter if it's your cryptocurrency. It doesn't matter whose cryptocurrency it is, and there's going to be no fanboying over here. <laughs> so we understand that there's this is going to be for certain people, but 
we understand a project like this is going to speak to the masses of people. And that's why we don't worry about a slow burn with our project. We don't worry about a slow burn with it. We don't worry about if it takes five or 10 years because we know this is going to be the model of the future simply because it's better than the other models. That's all I want to say in this video. If you like content like this, don't forget to like, subscribe to next time. As always, take care of yourselves and each other.